There is nothing worth living for unless it is worth dying for. My grandmother lived a life devoted to Jesus, and today her talks have been made available in their original form. So you too can be built up through the insights and mysteries God revealed to her throughout her ministry. Now, without further ado, here is Elizabeth Elliot. This morning, as you know, my topic is sacrament. Last evening, we talked about incarnation, God manifest in the flesh, a village woman chosen to be the chalice in which Christ would be born. And that word born is B-O-R-N as well as B-O-R-N-E. I have it born slash born. And I think of how Mary bore Christ all through his 33 years in hidden ways, in ways about which we know very little. You remember the time when Jesus was talking in a house. It was, I think it was the same story in which the man was let down through the roof, but the disciples came and told Jesus that his mother and his brothers were outside. And Jesus made another one of those statements, which I think must have in some measure pierced her heart. He said, who is my mother and my brothers? And went on to say that his mother and his brothers were those who hear the word of God and keep it. Well, of course, Jesus had seen that in his mother. He knew that his mother was exemplary in that very thing. He had watched both his foster father, Joseph, and his mother obeying God. And he was using her, I think, perhaps as an example. But nevertheless, emotionally, the word must have pierced her that Jesus, instead of immediately saying, bring her in, just spoke to the people and said, well, who is my mother and my brothers. So I think of her as a chalice all the way through her life, as you and I are meant to be. It is the life of Christ which is meant to be manifest in each one of us. And I trust that in this these few days together, this amazing privilege will be more deeply understood and more visibly manifested in the life of each one of us as we leave here. As I said, my, my purpose in these days is to try to give you principles of the spiritual life. So I hope you won't think that I'm sort of loading you down with, with heavy stuff without making it as practical and doable as possible. And I sort of lay, lean on the question and answer times to sort out some of those applications. But the word sacrament is not one that we Protestants very often think much about. We have, in most Protestant churches, there would be only two things that would be recognized as sacraments, and that would be the Lord's Supper, or communion, and baptism. And those are two things which represent for us invisible realities. So the definition of sacrament is a visible sign of an invisible reality. A visible sign of an invisible reality. But that is a very brief definition of a stupendous subject and one which affects my whole life in many thousands of ways. Because spiritual things are best understood through material evidence. And so when we go to the communion table or the communion rail, whatever your church has, we are looking at material evidence here, bread and wine, two very ordinary common things which were the stuff of any ordinary meal in Jesus' day. Bread and wine were the two things that were most ubiquitous. So we we look at those visible things and think of the invisible reality behind them, which is the blood of Jesus Christ. And again, we're thinking of another visible, tangible thing when we think of the blood of Christ, but it has tremendous significance for us, doesn't it? It's just loaded with significance. It is, uh, it's in Revelation that it says they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. 
And that is a mysterious statement, isn't it? How, how can we overcome through the blood? And the blood of Jesus will never lose its power. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. So it is the medium of our salvation and the flesh, the flesh of Jesus represented in the bread. When I lived in the jungle with Indians, of course, there was no such thing as bread. There were no ovens. There was no wheat. Their staple food was manioc, which is a starchy tuber that they cultivated. Uh, some of you are familiar with manioc. It looks sort of the shape of a carrot, but it's usually about this long, anywhere from this long to this long, brown skin on the outside, white on the inside, and it, it can be cooked in any way that potatoes can be cooked. It's really quite delicious, but it's very stringy, very heavy, and rather gluey. But that was, uh, sounds terrible, doesn't it? But it's not. <laughs> it can be fixed in many different delicious ways. But it was the staple food of the Indians, so generally that's what we used for the Lord's Supper instead of bread, that it was to them what bread is to us. Well, they had nothing even remotely resembling wine, so various things were used at different times. I remember one time when the cup actually contained shellac. Nobody intended that. It was a mistake. But it went all the way around the circle, and we used one cup. And it went all the way around the circle, and everybody was making grimaces, but we didn't find out until it got to us what the problem was. <laughs> anyway, I'm sure the Lord overlooks all sorts of weird mistakes. <laughs> but again, I repeat that spiritual things are best understood through material evidence, and we're talking the, in, during these days particularly about the material evidence in human lives. It is in our human flesh, it is in this body, it is within the context of the circumstances where God has placed us, that we are to live sacramentally. Now, Jesus used this principle constantly in his teaching. He gave lessons from nature. Revelations of God were embodied in ordinary things with which the people were very familiar. Jesus used salt, light, wind, wheat, stones, bread, sheep, birds, trees, and you can probably think of a whole lot more things, to open our eyes to spiritual truths. And we all, I think, would agree that we forget practically everything that the preacher said last Sunday except the illustration. And if he didn't use any illustrations, we'd probably forgotten everything. So it's very important that you and I be illustrations and that as we teach our children, we constantly try to embody the spiritual principle that we are seeking to instill in those children by specific visible signs. For example, how do you begin to teach courtesy to a child? Courtesy, as Emerson said, is many petty sacrifices. Courtesy is the willingness to accept a nuisance for the sake of somebody else. When my husband jumps out of the car in the rain and comes all the way around to my door with an umbrella, that's a real nuisance for him. He could get less wet by running straight into the building. But to teach a child courtesy, I would suggest just, just give you one very small, simple illustration. Teach him to pass the butter to daddy first before he takes the butter himself. This is a visible sign of an invisible reality, uh, the tremendous spiritual principle of my life for yours. And that is the principle which was manifest on the cross. Jesus was hanging there on the cross for our life. He said, the bread that I will give is my body, and I will give it for the life of the world. And we should be constantly asking the Lord to enable us, to empower us, to give us the privilege of giving this body for the life of the world in any way that God wants us to give it. So 
as you teach the child about the butter, you're teaching the child about this tremendous spiritual principle. Now, of course, you're not going to lay that heavy principle on the child, but you are beginning in small ways. You don't race up and down the stairs when somebody's sleeping. You don't slam doors. You don't leave your toys all over the living room floor. These are ways in which we are teaching my life for yours. You, of course, it's trouble. Petty sacrifices. So, again, I remind you that everything I'm talking about fits into everything else. We're going to be talking about sacrifice. This morning we're talking about sacrament. And Mary's offering of her body teaches me what it means to love God. She loved God's will. It meant offering her body, and she loved God thereby. Now, I have this beautiful poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins, which illustrates this in another few lines from Browning. If you're not familiar with Gerard Manley Hopkins, I recommend him. He's just uh, one of the great Christian poets from the 19th century, I believe. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. When you wake up this morning and you look out and I see the, the glittering of the lake and the sun coming through the trees, this is what I see, that the world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck, that's R-E-C-K, his rod, meaning understand, his rod. Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. Nor can foot feel being shod. We need to go barefoot once in a while, in other words. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last lights off the black west went, oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with, ah, bright wings. That Last, those last four words, I think, are just, well, ineluctably beautiful. Just the world, because the Holy Ghost over the, over the bent world broods with warm breast and with awe, bright wings. And of course, that's a metaphor from the first chapter of Genesis. The words about the Holy Ghost, I don't know what they are in the NIV, let me look. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So sacrament is a visible sign of an invisible reality. The question that I'm always wanting to ask is, does Jesus Christ make a difference which is discernible in your life? What kind of a difference do you expect Jesus Christ to make in your life? It's very obvious to me through the letters that come and the questions that are asked that the main difference that people expect Jesus to make is that he will answer their prayers the way they want them to be answered. And I think that's probably way down the list of priorities of what we should be looking for. Uh, Jesus Christ should be making a discernible difference in my life, even when I'm in the midst of the worst situation. He is not going to jerk me out of that. He is not going to bring my husband back from the grave. There are a whole lot of things which I would like to see God do that God is not going to do. God could have prevented the bombing in Oklahoma City. We have to face these realities and realize that God is up to something infinitely more mysterious and greater than anything you and I can ever imagine. And so, as we look at things through the glasses of sacrament, we begin to realize that 
there are they're just mysteries, so many mysteries that we cannot and are not meant to be stewing over. Is Jesus Christ visible? Do I manifest the reality of the Christ life in the way I live? The way I treat others, especially my husband and those who know me best. That's where the true test of the reality of our Christianity will be manifest. I have a friend named Jim who was one of my radio listeners in Boston, a very powerful, wealthy, uh, hard-driving, and by his own confession, totally selfish man. He lived for success, for money, for power, and he was amazingly converted just through a man that he met on the railroad station platform. They went to the they went on the same commuter train every day. And this man took him to a Bible class, and his life was completely turned around. And when he was telling us this amazing story, he said, the first thing that God said to me was, go home and love your wife. Now, to me, that has the ring of reality. That man was really converted. <laughs> and they... My husband and I were having dinner with him and his wife. And he t- it took about an hour for him to tell us his story. She didn't open her mouth. So when he finished and said that, I, t- of course, looked at her and I said, well, I'm just dying to know your, your side of the story. And she just shook her head. She said, I could not imagine what had happened to this man. She said, I just figured somehow or other he's faking this, you know, because we really were in a miserable marriage and we were on the verge of divorce. But she said it it took me a whole year to accept the fact that this man was really permanently, completely changed in a way that I could never have imagined. And of course, the change in her husband brought about her salvation. And now Lizzie has a very virulent form of cancer. And they, they he left all this big money and everything in Boston and he went to little college in Indiana because he wanted to be a servant and he's teaching in this small college and they had only been out there just a few months when they discovered that Lizzie has a very fast moving virulent form of breast cancer so you just might put Lizzie and Jim in your prayers but he he has written a number of prayer letters and also some personal letters to us in which it is very obvious that in this most severe test of his faith that man is triumphing. Honest, very, very honest about his devastation, his sorrow, his fear. But at the same time, he said, we do not believe that God does not hear prayer. He said, we believe that God hears prayer. We know that God could heal Lizzie. We also know that he might not. And we are going to continue to trust him. So... That is a discernible difference. He manifests the reality in the way he responds to this disaster. And as you've heard someone say, I don't know to whom this should be accredited, if arrested for being a Christian, would there be sufficient evidence to convict me? Does anyone know who said that? Think about it. We really don't know anything about this in this country, do we? But we had... Dr. Christy Wilson at our home a couple of weeks ago, a man who knows everything there is to know about what's going on in the mission field and statistics. His head is just a catalog and a card catalog of facts about missions and missionaries and martyrs. And he was telling us that there have been, uh, I had heard that there have been more martyrs in the last 50 years, Christian martyrs, than in all the rest of of Christian history. And he corroborated that and said it's... it's, uh, It's really quite staggering. I've forgotten the statistics he gave us, but I've I've heard that there have been 100,000 martyrs in China alone. And, of course, nobody knows who has been martyred in the Sudan. Nobody pays any attention to what's been going on in the Sudan, but there have been thousands upon thousands. Would there be enough evidence to convict you and me? We really don't know beans, do we, about suffering and the danger of being a Christian. We are here concerned with the shape of godliness as it is revealed in women of the 1990s. The other day I got a question in a meeting. Do you think we are 
Uh, what would you say to somebody who says, we are women of the 90s? Now, I don't know what the world the person meant by the question, but my answer was yes. <laughs> <laughs> What else could we possibly be? And I said, if, if this means that we take our cues from what the other women of the 90s are saying, then of course we're not women of the 90s. We take our cues from eternal principles. And when someone accused me many years ago when I was jumping up and down and screaming and yelling against the feminist movement, somebody said, well, you know, your views are really terribly Victorian. And I said, well, they're much older than that. <laughs> much older. <laughs> Amy Carmichael, in seeking recruits for the work that she was doing in India, said she did not want any milk biscuits. Now that means what we would say cookie cutter types. She's not trying to force everybody into a particular Donovore Fellowship mold. She didn't want any carbon copies or any clones. Now, who are the people who have shown you and not merely talked about the Christ life? They are the people whose living is sacramental. Whether or not they would use that word is not germane anyway. Um, it is the principle. Grace goes to work on our nature, whatever that nature may be. And we certainly have a variety in this room of different natures and personalities, I'm sure. And it is the grace of God, that marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe, that goes to work on my nature. Now, I could no more get up here and greet you the way Marty did this morning than I could fly to the moon. That's not my nature. And if I'm supposed to be all guns blazing and outgoing and bubbly and fun and charming, I might as well pack it in. <laughs> and it's just not going to work. But grace is working on me, I certainly trust, and it is working on each one of you. It does not abolish my nature, but it does transfigure it. It takes the very stuff, the very personality with all my peculiarities, my limitations, my uh, genes, my heritage, the environment in which I grew up, the age at which I am at this given moment, and it goes to work to transfigure it. Now, what form will that transfiguration take in you? What difference will it make? And we need to answer those questions insofar as we can. Of course, we don't know the ultimate end. We know that the time when we get to heaven, we are going to be given a name, a name that only God and I will know. And I think that that name will then reveal to me who I am. I'm not going to waste my time here on this earth trying to find out who I am. I cannot think of a more useless effort. Um, <laughs> or a more depressing result. <laughs> if I discovered who I am, I am sure that it would be far from what I would hope. Um, Goethe, the German philosopher, said, only God knows who I am, and may God preserve me from ever finding out. <laughs> so, God is in the business of taking what he put into me and taking all that I am by choice and transfiguring it because my supreme choice is thy will be done, Lord. Christ in me. That is my hope of glory. Revelation chapter 3 verses 14 to 21. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. 
You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so that you can become rich, and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes, so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Now that last verse, of course, is one that has been used mostly referring to salvation. Well, he's not referring to salvation here. Obviously, he's talking to the church. But... I think what Jesus is doing in every event of my life is knocking at the door, asking to be a part of that, to be received and welcomed into that particular event, my day. There are not very many days that have particularly important or memorable events, but in every circumstance, at every moment, He's saying, may I come in? May I enter into this with you and participate in it? And that will, that will certainly make a difference in our lives when we open the door. There are times when we, we don't want God to come in. We don't want him to have anything to do with whatever's going on. But he says, I will come in and eat with you. And in those days, of course, the word eating, the process of eating, the fact of eating, was a very important sacramental symbol. It indicates it's a visible sign of fellowship. So when we sit down and eat together with Jesus, then he goes on to say, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Think of the humility of God in knocking at the door. He could bust the door down, but he doesn't do that. Courtesy. Humility. He waits, and he knocks, and he says, will you receive me in this? Will you let me come in and share it with you? Or are you going to cherish your own self-pity in this and fend off my Holy Spirit? 1 Thessalonians 5.10 is another expression of the same desire of God. He died for us so that we awake or asleep might live in company with him. I love that. I want to live in company with Christ. And 2 Corinthians 5.15, his purpose in dying was that we might cease to live for ourselves. I've made quite a long list of the New Testament statements as to why Christ died. And we've, we've often glibly rattled off a couple of the reasons which are perfectly true, of course. And I remember a little song we used to sing, one of the few choruses that I knew when I was a child. We didn't have very many choruses in those days. But one, of, one was, everybody ought to love Jesus. He died on the cross to save us from sin. Everybody ought to love Jesus. And it's true. He died on the cross to save us from sin. He also died on the cross in order that we might live in company with him. It's not just a ticket to heaven. Not by any means. It's much more important, I think, that we emphasize to ourselves that his death on the cross was in order that we might live a sacramental life in his company and ceasing to live for ourselves. So as I told you, we're talking about sacrament, we'll be talking about sovereignty, servanthood, sacrifice, and suffering, and everything means everything. There isn't any way that I can neatly delineate between these. All is interconnected. Sun, moon, and stars in their courses above join with all nature in what? 
manifold witness. And I would trust that every single person in this room will be joined together in manifold witness, we ourselves, to his great faithfulness, mercy, and love. But everything, literally everything, I don't know how many of you watch those amazing David Attenborough programs on uh, on uh, public television. Very rarely do I have occasion to watch, but not very long ago, I watched his program on the red crabs of Christmas Island. Did any of you see that? Absolutely staggering. I didn't really know where Christmas Island was. I'm still not real sure. I think it's off the coast of Australia or something. Is that right? And there are literally millions of red crabs who live in the inner part of the island, but they have to migrate. The females migrate at a certain time of the year across the island to the sea and deposit their eggs. And then they go back again, and when they show these pictures, it was just as if the entire island was like a red rug moving. And they go back again, and then the males go to the sea and find those eggs and fertilize the eggs. So it was four different movements of these red crabs. Well, just that in itself is is just staggering, isn't it, to realize they know when to go, they know exactly what to do, they've never been there before, but... And then it told about how the, the tiny babies are born in the ocean and they're just so tiny and transparent you can hardly imagine that they can navigate at all. And they climb out of there and they start moving across the island again. But the exquisite detail that they brought out was that this crab, like all crabs, they have retractable eyes, you know, they come out on stems and they go back in to this eye cup they don't have any eyelids. So this crab has a limb with a tiny little brush. And he polishes. He sticks his eyes out and he polishes his eyes with this limb that has the brush on it. <laughs> and the eye retracts and then he cleans the, sur- the rim of the eye cup. Now, who thought that up? Of course, it was evolution, wasn't it? I mean, they, <laughs> they, did, they spent centuries and eons with dry eyes and no way to and so they decided we really need some way to um, solve this little problem here it's all interconnected everything means everything it's my God who thought that up for those crabs and teaches those crabs what to do have you ever watched birds building nests how do they know what kind of stuff to bring and how on earth do they ever put it together so it stays? Can you imagine trying to make a nest yourself with the best straw and cotton or whatever? No way in the world could you make it stick together. Now, the heart of the gospel is sacrificial love seen first in Mary, then in Christ in its most perfect form. One holy and complete offering. Sacrificial love was seen in Mary and in Christ in its most perfect form, one holy and complete offering. We are called to this same kind of love, self-giving, the offering up of ourselves, all that we are, all that we have, all that we do, and all that we suffer. Are, have, do, and suffer. These becomes offer- become offerings of love. Now, I'll try to make sure that you understand that I'm not making up my own Christian vision here, but it is clearly taught again and again in the scriptures. And Hebrews is perhaps the most important of the passages. The the entire book of Hebrews is full of mysteries and sacrament. Just for give you a few references that you can study for yourselves later. In Hebrews 1, 3, we read that the sun was the effulgence of God's splendor. The sun was S-O-N the effulgence of God's splendor, the stamp of God's very being. Of this, he, when Jesus Christ came into the world, it was in order to reveal the fullness, the effulgence of God's splendor. And everything that he did, everything that he said, everything that he was, bore the stamp of God's being, God's very being, sacramental. Hebrews 8, 5 
It says the priests serve at a sanctuary that is a copy, a shadow of what's in heaven. The visible sanctuary in the Old Testament represents heaven, things which are in heaven, a copy or a shadow. 9.23 speaks of copies of heavenly things which had to be purified by sacrifice. 9.24, Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Now, the word sacrament means mystery. The Latin word for mystery is sacrament. It means the unexplainable revealed, but not solved. The unexplainable revealed, but not solved. That is what mystery is in the scriptures, in in Christian thinking, Mystery has nothing to do with Agatha Christie and things like that. It's um, mysteries are revealed but not explained. Now, every all the great tenets of the Christian faith are mysteries: the Annunciation, the Incarnation, the Purification of Jesus in the Temple, the uh, cru- Crucifixion, of course the resurrection and the ascension. There's six major tenets of the Christian faith. All of them are mysteries. Could you possibly explain the gynecology, for example, of the virgin birth? Of course not. God does not explain them, but they are revealed. And so we apprehend them how? By faith. There is only one faculty with which we can apprehend those mysteries, and that is faith. And Ephesians 5 gives us a very specific example of an earthly representation of the mystery of Christ in the church, and that is marriage. The husband and the wife are, as it were, actors in a mystery play. You know, in the Middle Ages, they had what they called mystery plays, which was uh, troops, traveling troops of actors who went around to the villages and set up their little stage in the village square and acted out visible signs of invisible realities so that people could learn theology. These people were illiterate. They didn't have the Bible. They didn't know how to read anyway. And so they were given visible signs of the mysteries. And so they were called mystery plays. And that is exactly what is happening in a Christian marriage. We are an actors in a mystery play. The stage is marriage. The characters have already been cast. We are not free to interchange or to um, ignore the importance of the cast, of the casting. The husband has been cast as the head. That is not negotiable. That is not his choice. It's, it's not his achievement. It is not something I confer upon my husband. It is certainly not something that he and I sit down and vote on. <laughs> Whether he likes it or not, and most men I don't think really like it, let alone think very much about it, he's the head. And in the secular mind, headship would in, in, infer, in, imply um, tyranny, bossism, authority, whatever. Well, of course, Christ represents the head. The man represents Christ, who is the head of the church. So the two visible signs are husband and wife, who represent the invisible realities of church, of of, uh, Christ and the church. And this is at the heart of the whole argument about women's roles in the church and in the home, over and over again. I have been in situations where there was either a debate going on or I was part of a panel or something. Never once have I heard anybody mention the mystery. And to me, there's nothing else to talk about. That's it. I'm not, I have nothing to do with the fact 
of whether my husband is smarter than I am or better than I am or more spiritual than I am or whatever, I am to submit to him because he's my husband, as the church is to submit to Christ because Christ is the head of the church. So we, are, we have here the mystery of Christ in the church. Life, in other words, is absolutely loaded with meaning. In churches where there's an offertory, this is meant to be, but probably not very often explained, an offering of thanks, adoration, and a visible sign of the offering of myself. When I put my five dollars or whatever it is in the plate, it's not as though I'm saying, this Lord belongs to you. It's as though I'm saying, this Lord is a token that everything I have belongs to you. It's just a token of my adoration, my, of my giving of myself, of my substance. It is all taken up into one offering. As Jesus took upon himself the one perfect and complete offering, which was Jesus Christ. And you and I don't really have anything else to offer except Christ himself. Because Christ lives in me, Christ owns me, everything I have belongs to Christ. Therefore, my tiny little tokens, my praise, my thanksgiving, my money, my time, my sufferings, my possessions, all that I am, belongs to Christ. And in every way that I possibly can, I should be expressing that in my offerings. In other words, all of my life is meant to be an offering. That's what this plate means when it comes down the pew. It represents in a manageable, condensed form what I do every day of my life. The shape of godliness. Are you lost? Uh, my husband's back there giving me a two-minute sign. What am I? What happens if I go another ten minutes? Nothing. Okay, we. Well, you have to change it. Why don't you just come up here and change it? Then I don't have a whole lot more, but enough that I don't want to squeeze it into two minutes. And while he's coming, I'll give you this little poem, which will help you. It has just settled for me the whole question of what is this bread and this wine when we go up to the communion. I keep saying this. I, you've already guessed that I'm in a, I belong to a church where you get out of your seat, you walk up to the front, you get down on your knees, and you receive the bread and the wine. Um, and I can't help pondering the fact that the Catholic Church believes that this is literally the, the blood and the flesh of Jesus. And I'm not just going to wipe that off the board, but I don't, of course I don't understand it, and no Catholic is supposed to understand it. Again, it's one of the mysteries. But when I thought about it, I came across these four lines, which to me, uh, settle the question without explaining it. It's settled. Queen Elizabeth I is supposedly the author of this. So when you get that... Okay. Okay. His... His were the hands that break it, B-R-A-K-E, an, ancient, an old, old English word. His were the hands that break it, and his the word that spake it. In other words, when he took it into his hands, he said, this is my body. And his the word that spake it. And what his word did make it, that I believe, and take it. I'll read it again. His were the hands that break it. And his the word that spake it. And what his word did make it, that I believe and take it. And George Herbert, again, 17th century poet, said, Love is that liquor sweet and most divine, which my God feels as blood, but I as wine. Love is that liquor sweet and most divine, which my God feels as blood, but I as wine. And the core of my faith is Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. And that 
unchangeable verity is the anchor of my soul. And it became that in a new and powerful way when my husband, Ad, was dying of cancer. Everything in my life seemed to be crumbling. I just felt as if I had no strength left to bear what I was having to do in taking care of him and having to watch and having to listen to and having to face. And to go to church in which every Sunday we loudly proclaim in a body together, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. It just thrilled me to think that absolutely nothing that was taking place at home or was going to take place in a few weeks or months could change in the slightest particular those eternal verities. That is the rock on which my feet stand. As my dear friend Van, who spent 13 years in the Sudan and went through many experiences similar to mine, she was finally kicked out by the Arab government after doing a tremendous linguistic job that missionaries had struggled on for 50 years without success. Van cracked that language, and then the Arab government ruled it out altogether. It became illegal. Nobody was allowed to read, publish, or anything else in that language. And so it was 13 years of work essentially down the drain. And when she was kicked out, she came to Ecuador, to the jungle, to visit me instead of going home in the States. And she spent five months with me. We had been fr good friends in college and had not seen each other since college days. And as we sat and talked for hours and hours and hours of, about God's dealing with us, uh, Jim, of course, was dead by this time, I just remember Van saying, but bet my feet were on the rock, and the rock never moved. So, sacramental view. The breaking of bread is the great sacrament and sacrifice, the sacrament of the great sacrifice. It is both sacrament and sacrifice, and it is the sacrament of the great sacrifice, the sign of divine love, charity, and self-giving. Jesus calls us to this love. The whole office of bread is to be broken. The office of bread is to be broken, and that is our office, ladies. I never remember much of anything that was said in chapel services, chapel, chapel in Wheaton. We had compulsory chapel five days a week, for four years, I couldn't tell you very many things that I learned in all those, all those chapel services, but I have never forgotten this statement by a missionary from South America. She said, if, you're, if your life is broken when given to Jesus, it may be because pieces will feed a multitude and a loaf would satisfy only a little boy. Using, of course, the story of Jesus multiplying the loaves and the fishes. If your life is broken to, when given to Jesus, it will be because pieces will feed a multitude when a loaf would satisfy only a little boy. We are meant to be, as Oswald Chambers says again and again and again, broken bread and poured out wine. Don't be surprised. My life is to be a sacrament, a visible sign of the invisible reality of that broken bread and it is to be a sacrifice. Bread has no other function than to be broken and given so that others may have life. And pregnancy and birth would be an example of that. You are putting your life at the disposal of another life, and you go down to the very gates of death when you go into labor. In order to give life to that child, and you could not give life to that child without being a living sacrifice. Bread has no other function. And Mother Teresa says to her novices, those who come to work with her, the people will eat you up. You cannot do this. 
without receiving the bread of Christ. Something like that. I'm not giving you the exact words, but I, I remember those words, that concept from the, the film that was made of her with Malcolm Muggeridge's narration. The people will eat you up. We are not private persons. We are meant to be available. We have no rights of our own. And again, I remind you that faith is the only faculty by which we will apprehend these mysteries. And that's the end of this talk. I pray you've been encouraged and inspired by what you've heard today. And will keep joining us here and on social media for my granny's inspiration. Until then, remember, the eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms.